guys, so this is the final part or final section on the digestive system, which is chapter 25. So we left off in the stomach, right? We followed food from the oral cavity to the pharynx or throat. We followed it down the esophagus and eventually um, into the stomach. After the stomach, remember the food is gonna go through the pyloric sphincter and into the small intestine. When we look at the small intestine, the small intestine is called small because its diameter is relatively small, right? The diameter of the small intestine is about one inch. The large intestine is about two and a half inches. So it's called the small intestine because it's relatively thin. The diameter is thinner, but it is really, really long. Um, the small intestine is over, way over 20 feet long. So you've got a lot of small intestine that gets all twisted up into your abdomen here um, and the abdominal pelvic region. When we look at the small intestine, remember we break it up into three major sections. From the beginning to the end, it's the duodenum, the jejunum, and then the ileum. The duodenum is the initial segment of the small intestine. So this is the area that receives chyme Right, or receives that, that acidic substance from the stomach. The duodenum is relatively U-shaped, okay? and remember that it curves or wraps around the head of the pancreas like this. So it gets chyme from the stomach, the chyme comes down and the duodenum wraps around the pancreas, and then we'll curve down to the next segment of the small intestine. It's only about 10 inches long, so it's by far the shortest segment of the small intestine. And we call the duodenum the mixing bowl because it literally receives a bunch of ingredients from a bunch of different places and mixes them all together. Okay, just like when you're making a cake, you throw in the flour and the sugar and the eggs and you beat it all up. That's what happens in the mixing bowl or in the duodenum. So we just said that the duodenum receives chyme from the stomach. So the stomach empties into the duodenum. And then the duodenum also receives secretions from the pancreas. So the pancreas will release digestive secretions um, right into that duodenum as soon as the chyme comes in. And also the liver and gallbladder. Okay, so add gallbladder in here. The liver and gallbladder will release bile into the duodenum. So you've got all of these secretions coming from multiple different places and they all get mixed up in the duodenum before moving on to the rest of the small intestine. So functions of the duodenum. One, to accept chyme from the stomach, um, but then more importantly is what we do to that chyme. Remember that the stomach is extremely acidic, right? We just saw it uses hydrochloric acid to um, break down and help digest foods. That is very, very acidic. That will damage most other parts of the intestines. So we need to get rid of that acid before we send the chyme down the intestines. That's what we're doing here in the duodenum. So notice here, we put the chyme in the duodenum, right, from the stomach, and then right away we neutralize the acids. We'll see that the secretions that come from the pancreas are alkaline, okay, they're alkaline or basic, and their job, or one of their jobs, is to help to neutralize the acids that are present in the chyme before that chyme gets pushed down to the next segment of the small intestine. The small intestine is not equipped to be dealing with that acidic pH. Um, so we need to neutralize it right away in the duodenum. After the duodenum, we come to the jejunum. So the jejunum is the second or middle segment of the small intestine. It's quite a bit longer than the duodenum was. It's over eight feet long when it's relaxed. And the jejunum is where we have most um, digestion of nutrients and absorption of nutrients. So most of the actual breaking down of lipids and sugars and proteins, um, and then the absorption of the resultant nutrients, so glucose, fructose, um, fatty acids, amino acids, all of those nutrients are going to be absorbed in the jejunum. So out of the whole GI tract, most digestion and absorption of nutrients occurs in the jejunum. After the jejunum, the last and longest part of the small intestine is the ileum. Ileum is over 11 feet long, and the ileum ends at, remember, the ileocecal valve, or this is also called the ileal orifice. So the ileal orifice, or ileocecal valve, 
is what controls the flow of materials from the ilium, the last part of the small intestine, into the cecum, which is the first part of the large intestine. This valve or sphincter also um, contracts or shuts in order to prevent feces from backing up into the small intestine. The large intestine stores feces, right? Pretty much the, it's the end of the line. It's got the waste products that we're about to get rid of. Um, the small intestine, however, is still digesting a bunch of nutrients, absorbing a bunch of nutrients. So we don't want that feces to back up into the small intestine. So the ileocecal valve or ileo orifice helps to prevent that from happening. So when we look at the mucosa of the small intestine, we see that the mucosa is pretty complex. One, we see that the epithelium is made up of simple columnar cells. Okay, so that's like what we saw in the stomach, right? The stomach was um, simple columnar, so one layer of these tall column-shaped cells. Um, and, but when we look at the small intestine, we see that these cells are absorptive. Again, most nutrient absorption um, or taking of nutrients from the lumen and bringing them into the body is going to occur in the small intestine. So these epithelial cells have to be absorptive cells. When we look at the small intestine, we see that the mucosa is folded into this really distinct pattern. Um, this is only in the small intestine. It's not present anywhere else in the GI tract. We see that, like if this is the lumen that the food is passing through, the lumen of, or the mucosa of the small intestine is folded like this. It's not flat. It's folded into all of these finger-like projections. And we call these villi. So like villi is plural, um, a villus is just one. So each one of these little finger-like projections of the mucosa is called a villus. The reason that we have all of these villi present, all these finger-like projections in the small intestine, is to increase the surface area of the intestine. Um, the more curves we have, the more surface area we have, the more we can stack numerous cells all lining this small intestine. Okay, so remember, just like in um, when we did the skin or integumentary system, Remember we said it's curved between the epidermis and dermis to increase surface area? Anytime it's curved, it's to increase surface area. Um, so the whole reason we have these villi is to increase surface area. The more area, the more absorptive cells we can put here. The more absorptive cells, the more transporters, the more stuff we can absorb from the lumen of the GI tract into the actual fluids of the body. Um, in the center of each of these villi, we see that we have um, a lot of capillaries because we're going to be absorbing nutrients that need to get into the bloodstream, right? So if we have like amino acids or sugars or fatty acids, and we're going to take them, up, um, we're going to take them from the lumen of the GI tract into the body, we need to be able to um, absorb them into the bloodstream in some way. So we have a bunch of blood vessels, a bunch of capillaries that are present here. And then also in the center of the villi, we have this really distinct lymphatic capillary that's called a lacteal. So a lacteal is a lymphatic capillary. We'll see that lymphatic capillaries are gonna be very important for the absorption of fat and fat soluble vitamins. Um, fats are lipid soluble, right? They're hydrophobic, they don't like water. So we see that they tend to try and clump together in these kind of large structures that we call chylomicrons, and they need big passageways to enter into circulation. It's difficult for them to get into the blood capillaries um, because the pores aren't big enough. However, remember that lymphatic capillaries have relatively large uh, like gaps or spaces between cells and they have a lot of permeability or great permeability. So these lacteals or these lymphatic capillaries that come up the center of each of these villi are gonna be very important for the absorption of um, fats and anything that's fat soluble. We see that lining the small intestine, we have a lot of goblet cells that produce mucus so you'll see like the, um, the columnar cell, columnar cell, columnar cell, and then you'll see a goblet cell that makes mucus. Columnar, 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 and then another goblet cell. And just like we see everywhere else, the mucus is protective. 
right? It just um, kind of helps to lubricate everything and reduce friction so that the materials can move nice and easily through the small intestine. Now we do have a very highly specialized type of mucus gland that's present in the duodenum. Remember the duodenum is the very first section of the small intestine. When we look in the duodenum, we see that the mucus glands that are present there are called Brunner glands. And these Brunner glands secrete a very special alkaline mucus. Okay, it is not normal mucus. It is a very, very alkaline mucus. You know, remember alkaline is like basic. And when we talk about the duodenum, the duodenum is that first section that receives the chyme from the stomach. And remember, right away we put this really acidic chyme into the duodenum, and we are gonna rely on the pancreas to, um, to release this, this alkaline secretion to get rid of all the acid. But while that's happening, the lining of the duodenum is, is having to deal with its acid. Right? We dumped a really acidic substance into that duodenum. So it needs to protect itself from that acid until the pancreas can neutralize it. It does this um, via its Brunner glands. So the Brunner glands will coat the walls of the duodenum with a really thick, um, strong alkaline mucus. So the mucus itself is protective, and then the fact that it's alkaline means that when the acid tries to come in contact with it, we neutralize it. So there's this little extra wall of protection that's present in the duodenum only, because that's the area that's constantly receiving the really acidic chyme with that low um, acidic pH. We do also have what we call enteroendocrine cells here. Endocrine, remember, refers to hormones. Um, entero is just meaning the intestines. So enteroendocrine cells are like intestinal cells that secrete hormones. Um, these hormones are important because of um, kind of the, the direction or the control that they have over the GI tract. We'll see that the cells release gastrin. Um, gastrin comes from G cells. Remember we saw G cells and gastrin in the stomach as well. So also when we look at the small intestine, we, sell, we see um, G cells present that will make gastrin. Um, that gastrin really stimulates GI secretion um, and GI motility or movement of things through the GI tract. Um, the same thing with secretin, and we'll see that secretin also helps to, to, promote, um, to promote secretion, but the secretin as well as um, this one here, which is called cholecystokinin, both of these are going to be stimulating more of the pancreas and gallbladder as opposed to the intestines themselves in the stomach. Finally, when we look at the intestines, we see that we have intestinal glands present. Um, they're called intestinal crypts or crypts of Lieberkuhn. Um, and we see these at the base of the villi. So if we were looking at the lining of the intestine, and we would see that it goes up into this villi like this, and then it drops down below the surface and then comes up into another villus. Villus drops below. These down here, these little pits that go down deeper than the typical lining, those are the crypts of Lieberkens or the intestinal crypts. That's where most of the actual intestinal secretions come from. Okay, we do have um, between one and two liters of intestinal juices. So there's more fluid coming into the, um, into the GI tract from these intestinal glands. When we look at the intestinal glands, um, we see a bunch of water coming out in these secretions. There's some mucus. Um, it's mostly water, they're mostly fluid. And we do see enzymes coming from the small intestine. But the enzymes that come from the small intestine are in the form of what we call brush border enzymes. Okay, so at the very bottom of these crypts, we'll have constantly dividing cells. So there will be our columnar cells. And these columnar cells down here divide and divide and divide, and they just push the cells up and up and up until eventually they get to the very tip of the villi.
Um, now, if, when we look at these, we'll see that each of these cells has what we call microvilli on them. There, each of the cells has these tiny, itty bitty little extensions, and that's where the enzymes are going to be attached. Um, the microvilli are also for surface area. So like when we look at the small intestine, the villi, they have these finger-like projections that are large, that are lined with a lot of cells, those increase the surface area of the small intestine by about 10 times. Yeah, that's a pretty big increase. Then when we look at each of these individual cells, we see that they have tiny little extensions on their surface. Those are called microvilli, right? Or like tiny villi. Those will increase the surface area of the small intestine by another 20 times. So the villi and the microvilli greatly increase the surface area of the small intestine, which again helps for digestion and absorption. Um, again, all of the enzymes that are coming from the intestinal glands are gonna be enzymes that are attached to these microvilli. And when you look at the microvilli, it looks like a brush. You like bristles of a brush. There's all these tiny little projections. So we call those microvilli the brush border. Okay, it looks like a brush all along the border of the intestines. Um, so brush border enzymes are the enzymes that are attached to that brush border. All right, so here we see um, quite a few things. One, we're looking at the small intestine, and just like we saw in lab, we have the mucosa, right? This is by the lumen where the food's gonna be going through. Um, underneath the mucosa, we have the submucosa, which is connective tissue, the muscularis externa, which remember is two layers of muscle, and then outside of that um, is the serosa. So we've mostly been focusing on the mucosa, the innermost layer that comes in contact with the food. We said when we look at the small intestine that this is organized into these finger-like projections, right? And we call those villi. The villi increase the surface area so that we can absorb more nutrients from the small intestine. If you look down at the base of the villi, you'll see how we drop down into this little pit or crypt, and we call those intestinal crypts or crypt of lubricants. Um, also, you can see going up the center of each of these villi, we've got capillaries. And then in green, that's showing you the lacteal, the lymphatic capillary, which we'll look at in more detail in just one second. So this is showing you um, one of the villi in more detail. So you can see the mucosa has this big finger-like projection. That's a villus. That will increase the surface area of the intestine by 10 times. When you look at this villus, notice that it's lined with simple columnar cells. Okay, so there's tons and tons of simple columnar cells. Then when you look at the very surface of these columnar cells, that's where the brush border is. That's where all these tiny little hair-like extensions are. Those are the microvilli that increase the surface area by another 20 times. So the columnar epithelial cells, these are the absorptive cells that are gonna absorb nutrients into the body. Um, every so often we have a mucus cell. Okay, the mucus cell just secretes this lubricating um, mucus that reduces friction. Those are gonna be highly specialized, remember, in the duodenum. But through the rest of the GI tract, or through the rest of the intestines, they're just normal mucus glands. Um, looking up in the center of this villus, again, we've got a big capillary network because there's gonna be a bunch of nutrients here. We're gonna absorb them into the fluid, the interstitial fluid, and then we need to absorb them into the bloodstream. In green, this green line is showing you the lacteal. Again, that's a capillary from the um, lymphatic system, and that has a greater permeability than the normal blood capillaries. So because that has a greater permeability, the lacteal is gonna be really important for um, absorbing fats. They are lipid soluble things that are not water soluble. So lipids, lipid soluble vitamins, um, anything that doesn't like water, we're gonna absorb into the lacteal instead of straight into the bloodstream. So we mentioned brush border enzymes. Um, and I said that brush border enzymes are the main 
enzymes that are gonna come from the intestinal glands. So the enzymes that are actually made in the intestines are the brush border enzymes. Um, we call them brush border enzymes because they're attached to the brush border, right? So when we see all of these um, columnar cells, we said that they have tiny little microvilli on their surface. Here, it's probably hard to see on here, but like the cell ends right here. All of this like fuzziness on the end is showing you the brush border. Those are the little microvilli that stick out on the surface. Well, those microvilli have integral membrane proteins. Integral meaning like in it, like attached, completely attached. These proteins are the enzymes. So the enzymes that are made in the intestines are actually attached to this brush border. Hence, we call them brush border enzymes. So typically, while the enzymes are actually attached to these cells, they can only metabolize or break down materials that are in contact with the brush border. So um, while they're attached to these cells, they're only gonna work on nutrients that are right here, right? Because they're attached, the enzyme's not coming up and going anywhere. So it's just gonna be breaking down things that are really close to the lining of the intestines. However, remember I said that um, down here in this intestinal crypt, these cells are constantly dividing. Right? So these cells divide and make more and more and more and they push up and up and up and up and up. Eventually, when these cells get to the top of this villus, they get shed because there's always new cells coming up. Right, So the oldest cells up here get lost. They get shed into the lumen of the small intestine. When that happens, the cell gets broken down and the brush border enzymes get released into the lumen of the small intestine. At that point, they can actually um, break down materials that are, that are more central in the center of the small intestine. But they have to actually be released from the brush border before they can do that. There are numerous different brush border enzymes, um, and each of them are gonna break down or metabolize a different type of nutrient. All of these first ones break down carbohydrates. Okay, so maltase breaks down maltose into glucose. Okay, it breaks down a larger carbohydrate into a monosaccharide, simple sugar. Sucrase breaks down sucrose into glucose and fructose, which remember are both monosaccharides. Okay, simple sugars. Lactase breaks down lactose into glucose and fructose. So the name tells you um, very, obviously what it's breaking down. Remember, ACE refers to the enzyme, and then the beginning is telling you um, the, the nutrient that it's actually working on. Again, breaking down larger sugars like disaccharides and trisaccharides into small monosaccharides or simple sugars. We started this process of breaking down sugars in the mouth, right? Remember we had salivary amylase, and that salivary amylase would start breaking down large polysaccharides. Um, but we're still continuing to break these down in the small intestine until we get down to these individual little small monosaccharides that we can absorb and utilize. Nucleosidases break down nucleotides. So nucleotides, remember, are in our DNA and RNA. So nucleosidases are gonna break down those nucleotides into the nitrogenous base so remember that was like adenine, cytosine, guanine, uracil, thymine, those bases, and then the sugar that's attached, the pentose or five carbon sugar, which remember is ribose in RNA and deoxyribose in DNA. Peptidase and dipeptidase break down peptides into amino acids. Again, remember we started breaking down proteins earlier, right? We started to break down proteins in the stomach um, with pepsin, Pepsin broke down a really large protein into smaller peptides. Um, now the dipeptidases and peptidase is gonna break down those peptides into even smaller nutrients, which are amino acids. Um, enteropeptidase is important because it's gonna activate an enzyme that comes from the pancreas. So the pancreas is gonna release something called trypsinogen, and trypsinogen is inactive, it's a proenzyme. It needs this enteropeptidase in order to activate it into its active form trypsin, which then breaks down proteins. 
um, really similar to the stomach. Remember in the stomach, we released pepsinogen, which was an inactive proenzyme, and that got activated into pepsin, then it broke down proteins. Okay, so from the pancreas, we have trypsinogen, it gets activated into trypsin, and then it can break down proteins. And this is just protective. Um, we don't want to be breaking down proteins in the pancreas because the pancreas is made of a bunch of proteins. We don't want to break down the actual duct system and the cells that are there. So we wait to activate it until it's in the lumen of the GI tract so that it can work on um, the food that we've eaten instead of the actual body cells. Because of the muscularis externa that's present, that layer of, or double layer of muscle, that's present in the small intestine, we do have multiple different types of movements that are possible. So segmentation is kind of a simple mixing movement. Remember that we have um, this circular muscle, right? Circular bands of muscle that go around the tract. When we look at those, one will contract when the one next to it relaxes, then that one contracts and this one relaxes, and you get this movement. Okay, that's segmentation. It just swishes the materials back and forth, back and forth, and just mixes them up. We also have peristalsis occur. Peristalsis is not um, for mixing, it's for propelling things through the GI tract. So peristalsis, remember, is a wave-like contraction that continues from beginning towards the end and it propels things through the tract. Peristalsis is pretty slow. Um, it's kind of this weak, slow, but really steady thing that's happening all throughout the small intestine. Remember, we have over 20 feet of small intestine. That's a long length that we've got to push food through. So we just really slowly push it through. It's got to be slow so we have time to digest the food and to absorb all the nutrients. Um, but we don't want anything to get backed up in the small intestine. So when there's when they're stuck in there, it is relatively um, constant or relatively steady that it happens.